Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the joint Heidelberg Astronomical Colloquium. It is a great pleasure to welcome Steve Shaw from the, uh, not University of Pisa, but the National Institute, no, University, of University of Pisa. Uh, and he's also visiting University of Prague, the Karls University at the moment. And he will be speaking to us about uh, classical NOVA, and he has a very interesting subtitle, Cosmic Test Ban Violations. And so we will see how political the discussion gets today. So a few words on, on the speaker. Steve got his PhD in um, the University of Toronto. He then moved on to do uh, a short postdoc at the University of Toronto and then moved on to Columbia University of New York. From that he moved to Case Western uh, University in Cleveland, then to the Space Telescope Science Institute. Then he moves to New Mexico to the Institute of Mining and Technology. Um, so you really went through all the different places in the US and Canada. From that, he went to Goddard Space, Space Flight Center. And finally, he was working at Indiana University as full professor for quite a long time, 10 years. But then in 2004, he decided it's much nicer in Venice, Europe, in Italy. And so he moved to Pisa. And since then, he is uh, working as scientist at the University of Pisa and the INFN Sezione di Pisa. So please, let's welcome Steve and uh, learn more about classical law. Um, well, first, uh, it's been a long time since the last time I saw Heidelberg. Um, and it's good to see that some of the old faces are still here. Um, and thank you. I, I, I want to make sure that, that especially the students understand this. This is going to be a pretty lousy talk. Um, it's going to be as simple as, as it can be in, in the basic physics because, frankly, novi are very simple objects. Um, that's, I think, what makes them so attractive. They, they're a chance to do something in astrophysics that, that we rarely get a chance to do of seeing a very wide range of phenomena that happen in real time and, and yet not so fast that we have to worry about relativistic effects and not so slow that we have to worry about employment. Um, so they can actually happen within, say, the time scale of a PhD thesis, something less than 10 years. Um, and, and yet something that's a little bit faster than um, Oh, forever. Now, let me make one, one point that novi as, as objects have been known for a very long time. Uh, and the basic physical process behind them has been identified for a very long time. And that's why I started with, with this title about nuclear tests in space. Uh, you can think of novi essentially as either um, extremely powerful hydrogen bombs that uh, don't come under the test ban treaty and consequently are at several hundred parsecs or more, or as um, the equivalent of the helium flash occurring without several solar masses of material on top of it. That is, this is a chance for us to study the sorts of processes that happen on different time scales, very deep generally in stars, uh, that happen also in the boundaries of accretion disks and close binary systems, and so across a, a wide variety of areas. And I'll, I'll try to make a couple of examples of that uh, clear. And let me just say that if you've got any points you, you want to bring up as questions or comments, just interrupt, okay? That's understood? Um, I'm 
I never feel comfortable giving formal talks. I, I'm afraid I've been, I'm too antique a professor for that. I just look at this as a sort of teaching. So um, let, let me, the, the, the obligatory but pleasurable point, um, this, this is something that um, in, in the, to, to make a political comment in, in the words of a former American presidential candidate, it takes a village to do this sort of thing. I'm going to concentrate on the interpretation of observations. And so the multi-wavelength observations have involved everything from gamma ray to centimeter wavelengths, all coordinated simultaneously for these objects. Um, several of the names on that list will be familiar to you. It also involves doing nucleosynthetic calculations in hydrodynamic environments, modeling the ejecta, and then also one of the things that's a recent development, the role of amateur spectroscopists in this business. Um, the ARAS group, which is an international group of amateur astronomers who do uh, medium and high resolution spectroscopy uh, has been involved and this allows us to cover 24 hour in both hemispheres given the distribution of these people um, up to resolutions of 30,000 on fairly moderate si moderate sized telescopes um, and then also just the, the standard list of facilities like every telescope we can get our hands on and every photon we can get our hands on. So in to, to explain the, the, the background of this project, um, there was a meeting in Cape Town, the last meeting on Novi uh, about four years ago, five years ago. And uh, at that meeting, one of the things that emerged was we understand a lot about individual novi, or we understand the, we know the phenomenology of many of these systems, but the systematics are missing. That is, every time you tried to study one of these objects, we'd always found that there was something missing. Either there were infrared observations, but you had no ultraviolet, or you had uh, X-ray, but you had no gamma ray. You had optical and nothing else. And this has been historically true for at least the last 40 years. So a group of us, that village, decided we were going to get together and plan out exactly what we would want to know from the next bright galactic nova, whatever it was. And we had a meeting four years ago in Pisa and planned this out. And one month later, Nova Delfini V339 Delphini, one of the brightest novae of the last hundred years, went off. And at that point, we had complete panchromatic coverage. That is, everything from roughly 100 MeV down to uh, 10 centimeters. Uh, that was the project that we decided to call Novi R Us. Um, it's the American influence. Uh, but but in the sense of PISA, this was starting from the very earliest stages, so earliest meaning when the system is optically thick and following it in every wavelength region as closely in time as possible. And I'll show you some of those results and try to explain it. Um, so let me begin with the basics. Uh, Novi are binary systems. Having said that, you've said everything. That is, you have a degenerate object, which is not necessarily a full professor, accreting mass from a companion, which may or may not be filling its Roche lobe, which may or may not be a main sequence object. That's much less important than the mass of the white dwarf. That is, these systems are all more than one solar mass, they are not as with one exception, possibly, they're not helium white dwarfs. These are either CO or oxygen neon. So they've somehow been stripped and they've already gone through 
substantial evolution, and then they find themselves either in a close system with a period of longer than about two hours, so separations of the order of less than one solar radius, or they find themselves in extremely wide systems. And this is why I'm not going to talk extensively about that, but the system V407 Cygni, which was uh, Nova 2010 Cygnus, is a symbiotic type system that is like, some of you may know the names, RS Ken, Ken, uh, sorry, RS Ophiuchi or uh, T Core Bohr. These are systems which are recurrent novi, recurrent meaning they occur within roughly 10 year time scales or uh, the time that somebody will be going into retirement. Uh, that is, they recur within a human lifetime. And there appears to be, I should just add, only one simple distinction. Novi either recur on timescales of a century or so, or they don't. That is, they are not recurrent on timescales of more than a millennium. And there's really at least an order of magnitude gap between those. Of those which are recurrent, a small group of them sit in this class that look exactly like symbiotic stars. That is, they have red giant companions and they're either accreting directly from a wind or they're accreting from a focused wind. That doesn't matter. What does matter is that it's a white dwarf, it's massive, and it's accreting under conditions which lead to deep mixing and the accumulation of material on the dwarf. Now, that's the key point here. Novi are sort of nuclear proactive garbage dumps that they sit and accrete for a long time and then ignite. That a sufficient amount of material builds up so that you get a piconuclear reaction which initiates on the white dwarf. How that happens, we don't know. We can simulate it beautifully and we have no idea how to set up the initial conditions. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But the basic point is you have a hydrogen rich layer which is accumulating on an object of very different abundance. That material in building up ignites a nuclear reaction under semi-degenerate conditions. That is the pressures and densities under which the ignition takes place make it a partially degenerate environment which reacts more by generating a strong turbulent convection and deep mixing than by direct expansion. So the first thing that happens is for the first few hundred seconds after the initiation of the nuclear reactions, the layer very deeply mixes. This mixing brings up, dredges up material from the white dwarf, which serves as a fuel for the reaction. And the system eventually be, is event, it continually expanding, but eventually reaches nearly sonic velocities, at which point the reactions fizzle. Now, you would think that that's the end of the story, but because this is producing a, a nuclear chain of, uh, it's producing garbage from an incomplete CNO process. The time scales here are about a thousand seconds for, from the initiation when it finally happens to the point at which the reactions essentially shut off. That is, the layers have started to expand and the temperature begins to drop. At that point, the decay of the ox of things like oxygen 15, uh, the beta decay nuclei reheat the ejecta and blow it off. So the initiation of the explosion is actually a very simple detonation. The result is the ejection of an envelope of anywhere from 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus five solar masses in most of these systems, it may be a little bit less, but that order of magnitude. 
So it's not, we're, we're not dealing with a supernova, okay? We're not dealing with something that's going to have a very strong dynamical effect on the environment. Instead, we're dealing with the result of a process, and I'll keep coming back to this point. This is something that allows us to understand a range of astrophysical processes that express themselves in many other environments. And this is the reason I think these are especially interesting, not because we're going to solve any deep cosmological mysteries from them, but because understanding these, we, see, we have a window into processes that will then teach us how to do other things. Okay? I hope that's clear. So, what we've been trying to do in this particular project since we can't see the initiation, this is occurring both quickly and deeply. What we see is the result of the expansion. That is, the ejection of the outer layers that are originally optically thick, and we get to see them in the expansion as they become optically thin. Since we're dealing with something that has no internal energy sources, we can actually understand things like the spectral formation because it's a pure photoionization process. It's straight, simple, ra passive radiative transfer. We don't have to worry about deep mixing of gamma sources. We don't have to worry about any internal sources. The white dwarf simply remains hot and illuminates the ejecta. Okay? So far? Now, to give you an idea of what we are talking about here. Let me just show one thing, which is, um, actually before I go to that, I told you this was going to be semi-improvised. Um, let me show you one example of the kind of data that one has to deal with in this expansion. Now, can you all see this blackboard if I use it? Okay, so we have the, we have the following. We have an expanding ejecta, never mind if it's spherical or not. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Inside somewhere, there's a radiation source. That is, there's a hot, post-explosion white dwarf, which is illuminating this material. So, deep inside here, there's an effective photosphere, and beyond that, we have ballistically expanding ejecta, okay, with a very strong density stratification. This is a constant mass shell, so we don't have to worry about the sort of problems you would encounter in the ejection of a supernova, for example. Here, we have a linear velocity field, and we know what the density field is, so it's a very well-specified problem. Now, the outer portion here is becoming optically thin rather rapidly. The inner portion is rapidly cooling. This is still optically thick. Uh, this, when I say still, I'm talking about the first, say, 10 to 20 days of the expansion. Okay? Not the first 10 or 15 seconds. This inner portion is then serving effectively as a photosphere illuminating the outer part. The outer part was originally completely ionized. It was expanding as a pure fireball. It then recombines when the temperature drops below about 15 or 20,000 degrees. Now, this is something that should sound very familiar to many of you especially here because luminous blue variables is um, or was a, a local uh, industry, that this is sort of an LBV in fast forward. That is, you have the initial expansion cooling the formation of an iron curtain when the material recombines and a sudden increase in the opacity, okay? That increase in the opacity from the outer parts manifests itself in two ways. First, in term in the individual line profiles and the way that the lines are formed, 
but more importantly, it takes everything that was coming from the photosphere and the central object, which would normally have been coming out in the ultraviolet and consequently illuminating the outer part, which is the original spectrum that we see. Okay, so helium and fairly highly ionized uh, iron group elements. And then when the recombination occurs, you see a rapid increase in the visual brightness, and that is the NOVA event as we've known it for the last couple of hundred years. That is the signal of the formation of first of the explosion and then of the recombination wave is the rise of a nova and consequently the time for the rise and the brightness of the nova in the optical is linked to the phenomenology connect of the ultraviolet opacity of the various heavy elements, specifically the iron peak. Now to show you what this means, I thought you might like seeing not a simulation, uh, but real observations. This is the calcium uh, H and K lines. Let me go a little bit more slowly on that. Um, so, that is, this is in velocity, this is centered on the K line, so this is the interstellar line. You first form a strong P Cygni component which is when you're seeing the outer portions of the ejecta and then the ejecta turn optically thin and the line disappears. That is, at this point, the only emission that we're seeing is from the reionization of the ejecta. Um, okay, I've just jumped too much. So let me explain. This continues to expand. The first thing that you have is the formation of what looks like a P. Cygni line. So it looks like a stellar wind, okay? That absorption is seen in a velocity gradient, which is very large, usually a few thousand kilometers per second between the optically thick surface and the outer portion. As this expands, there's still the central object which is illuminating this. And so the photosphere, the effective photosphere is moving inward and the temperature is going up, okay? Eventually that temperature gets high enough that the envelope reionizes. And at that point we see the emission spectrum that's characteristic of the later stages of NOVI, which is this, that is any of the low ionization species simply disappear and we see the high ionization species that remain. In this case, this line is one of the bomber lines. Now, the reason for going through all of this is that in each one of these stages, we have a particular layer of the ejecta exposed to us. And so as the expansion proceeds and the opacity is changing, we're effectively peeling away the individual layers as individual species go into emission. We can see not only the structures that were imposed, the dynamical structures that were imposed on the envelope, but also get some idea of whether the envelope is, com the ejecta is completely chemically homogeneous. Since we know the velocity field, every point in the line profile maps to a position in the ejecta. This is something we don't have in stellar winds and we don't have in any other object that can be so easily studied. That is, because we know that the ejecta are ballistic, there's a complete match, a choice between velocity and radial position within the ejecta. So we can go from the line profile to the position in the structure. That's the example I'm showing here in the optically thick stage, 
of three of the most recent novae at a similar stage in their expansion. That is, we have individual structures which are seen in absorption, which are seen against this pseudophotosphere, and then the outer portion here that's producing the emission lines. In this case, this is one of the iron two species. It happens to be especially interesting because it's one of the strongest iron lines in the visible spectrum. And more importantly, it's not blended with anything. Um, and it's directly connected with the ultraviolet through a ground state transition. So in this case, the thing that I want you to concentrate on, t picks is a recurrent nova. Dell the, is the one I was mentioning that went off in 2013. And Nova Sen, the 1369 Centaurus, uh, went off about six months later. So within the time scale of this project, we've actually had two of the four brightest novae of the last hundred years go off. And fortunately, at the same time, we also had the entire spectrum covered by a combination of satellites and so on. Yes? Okay, as if I've understood the question, because the acoustics are miserable, um, as the ejecta are expanding, their optical depth is, of course, dropping. Okay? Um, now, the advantage is so the optical depth is going roughly as one over t the time squared. Now, that's if you don't include the fact that this inner object, the white dwarf, is still at roughly constant luminosity for an extended period of time, okay? And so as the pseudophotospheres, the optically thick surface in the inner portion of the ejecta moves backward, the effective temperature of that surface is going up, okay? And so it's illuminating the shell itself. As a result, eventually the ionization increases in the outer part and the opacity drops even farther. And at that point, there is one stage where, because this is finite ejecta, the effective photosphere effective, it just drops out the bottom. The ejecta turn completely optically thin and for a period of time, totally ionized. And even high enough density, because this happens at densities of, of no lower than about 10 to the eight per cubic centimeter. So this is still more or less in photoionization equilibrium. Then if you wait a bit, because at velocities of a few thousand kilometers per second, the expansion of the ejecta will eventually lead to a frozen state. I'm gonna to get to that. But where we can no longer use the normal assumptions of photoionization equilibrium. But in that intermediate state, as the ionization stratification changes within the ejecta, we can look at the individual substructures that are there. And that's what you're seeing. In fact, that's what you're seeing here in the absorption. Okay, we'll try the laser spotter here. Gee, that has a, the, the rise time of a nova. That's impressive. Um, in fact, it has just, just about the same spectral distribution, too. So these, what appear to be absorption knots, are just that. They're absorption knots. That is, here you have the photosphere, and there's some sort of structure that is present in the ejecta, even in the time when the ejecta are optically thick. Now, this means that something is happening during the explosion that imposes, and this is the advantage of ballistic structures, that imposes individual large-scale structure on the ejected material. Okay, what I mean by that is, is that something simple. 
Each one of these has a velocity width of no, maybe 100 kilometers per second. And there's some fine structure, some fine substructure in that. Since the expansion is ballistic, every one of these features maps into some depth, okay? The velocity is equivalent to a radial distance. Now, that also means that if we have structures that are a few, like 10 kilometers per second wide, these are between one and 10% the thickness of the ejecta, okay, along the line of sight. Since these are in absorption, we know where they are relative to the central object, and we know what fraction of the photo, uh, what, what their covering fraction is. So we can use these to say that at the time of the explosion, this is not homogeneous, spherical, uniform shell ejection. There are strong asymmetries here. There are strong uh, substructures which are organized structures and we can then compare the abundances of these as I'll show you in, a later, in later stages of, of the expansion. So, um, in fact, why don't I just go to that? This is something we've never had before. And this was the result of this project. I showed you the beginning of the explosion. This is the end from the same novi. This is looking at a species now with the ejecta completely ionized. And here, this is the nitrogen five line, which is an ultraviolet line. You will not see this kind of data again in your lifetime, I'm afraid. Uh, this is probably the last time HST will ever get something like this. But these individual structures, and these are the same novae you were looking at before, except those were the iron lines. These individual structures show up on all of the ultraviolet resonance lines. In other words, these are structures which persist in the expansion for hundreds of days. This is 800 days after the explosion. Completely optically thick, totally frozen structures at exactly the same velocities. So this is what I meant by peeling through the ejecta. Okay? I hope that now answers the question. Um, so, Why don't we just um, skip a bit? Okay, this was just to emphasize what I was saying before. Um, this is Nova Cygni in 1992 uh, in the optical. This is what you normally think of as a Nova light curve. The rise time is maybe 10 or 15 days. Then the velocities are only a few thousand kilometers per second. Again, these are not the sorts of velocities you that are characteristic of supernovae, okay? But otherwise, the spectral line formation is virtually identical. The rise corresponds to something that, again, we will never have access to. This is a unique observation, unfortunately. That is, in this time, it's perhaps difficult to see what's going on here, but this was a two order of magnitude drop in the ultraviolet flux in exactly the same time as the rise. That's what I meant by flux redistribution, that the passive filter of the ejecta simply converts the light of the central white dwarf, which is coming out initially in the ultraviolet, into the visible, which means we can do some kind of a bolometric study here. Okay, so we can take these two parts, that is the ultraviolet and the visible, we can compare how much light is coming out in the visible and from that we can get a preliminary idea of what the filling factor of the ejecta is. Um, this is a sequence showing in spectral detail what I just showed you in the photometry. And this is the difference between photometry and spectroscopy. 
If we were just doing the photometry, the only thing we would have is the bulk energetics. This shows the redistribution. This is the same thing that occurs in a type two supernova. It's the same thing that occurs in a type one. That is, the change in the relative bolometric distribution of the radiation field doesn't care where the source is, it just cares what the opacities are. So this is the early fireball stage at which the, the, the radiation continued down below 1200 angstroms. This is the equivalent photospheric energy distribution of a, like a 20,000 degree object. Within a matter of a couple of days, this has expanded and cooled. The temperature drop here was about 5,000 degrees and this is not spectra, th these are not spectra that are missing. There's no flux there. This is below 2,000 angstroms, so this is what you saw in that drop. This is the actual rise of the nova, and then all of these are to the same scale, so you can see that as the expansion proceeds, the lines simply go into progressively thinner and thinner condition, the ionization increases, and so by the time you're at about 50 days into the outburst, the ejecta suddenly turn completely optically thin. Okay, the same thing will happen in supernovae, except the time scales are different. Now, just to show, it, it really doesn't matter uh, which kind of nova you're looking at. The one I was showing you before was a little bit more energetic. It was an oxygen neon. This is a prototypical oxygen neon system. This one is a carbon oxygen white dwarf. Uh, it's the same thing. We just didn't catch it as early. And unfortunately, I'm showing this one actually as a joke here because um, OS Andromeda um, happened to have gone off at a very inconvenient time because just at the point where it was turning optically thin, uh, Supernova 1987A went off. And so uh, you can guess which one won. Um, so th this is the, a high resolution sequence just showing that again, as the ejecta expand, you first get the transition stage where you have both absorption and emission and then it goes into emission and everything turns essentially boring. That is, you can see right through the ejecta. Okay, that's at least what we used to think as being boring, but this is the other thing that has been known for a long time. I hope you can see this. Um, this is a sequence on a nova showing the H alpha profile and just showing that you start out with something that looks uh, actually rather asymmetric in one sense and then turns asymmetric in another sense and then turns more or less symmetric at the end. This is simply that you're seeing optical depth changes. So one of the things that has always been a problem is that we have, say, one line to work with. This is one of the reasons for the project. And from a single line, you, you can't tell anything because you can't see whether this is structural change that we're somehow revealing. The line profiles you see are changing in time. So this almost gives the impression that something dynamical is happening like secondary ejection events or something like that, where in fact, it may just be an optical depth effect. Okay, so just to jump forward, um, this is another example of what I was talking about, that in the earliest stages, you see multiple structures in the lines even in neutral species, in this case, this is the sodium D lines in a nova that form dust, where you can see 
that there are two primary structures here that change over time. This is a sequence going in time. Uh, and you can see both the D, D1 and the D2 lines showing these structures. These are large scale structures. We, again, we've known about these for a very long time, but this is the sort of data that we had to deal with, one, two, or three spectra, and nothing else. Okay, so this is where we are now. These are different iron lines in one of these novae followed intensively. The structures you see start out here as what appear to be uniform p signi like profiles, which then break up into filaments. These aren't breaking up, we're seeing through them. And the same thing is going to happen when you do high resolution observations of supernovae and of planetary nebulae and obviously also of stellar winds. Something is structuring these ejecta and we seem to see things that look relatively simple and filled only because they're so optically thick, we can't usually see these individual substructures. But these were there as early as the beginning of the explosion. Now, they also survive. This is what I was showing you before, except this is the substructures on different lines of the same nova in the early stage when we're only seeing excited states, and then these are the structures that survive into the later stages when we're looking completely through the ejecta. Okay, now uh, one might think that you need some very sophisticated methods to understand what's going on in an object as apparently complicated as these spectra indicate. You really don't. Um, this sequence is what you would get for a recombination wave in the earliest stage of the expansion. Each one of these is, oh, the sequence covers about one week. It's just a simple Monte Carlo simulation in which you have the radiative. This one is assuming a resonance line, yes. As it's re as it's recombining, yes. So um, the expansion toward higher velocity is the ex is the recombination wave moving outward, and. In the ionization sequence, then it would go in exactly the opposite direction. So the, there's, there's been, a, there have been reports over the decades of multiple ejection events, for example, and of accelerating flows and multiple velocity fields. And again, all that is is taking these structures and simply having them individually recombine. So if you have, for example, structures like this that are um, dynamical structures here posed on the, on the ejecta, as the wave passes the radius at which these are located, you're going to see an absorption feature suddenly appear at that velocity. Now certainly this is going to happen in stellar winds too. The difference is in a stellar wind, this is happening in an accelerating flow. These are stationary flows. Okay, these are just freely. Yes, yes, and in fact, these show up as emission structures when the line turns optically thin. Um, the reason here you're not seeing the emission is because it's so late that the emission, the emission measure has 
simply drop the f below your, your limit of detection. And the only thing you're seeing here is that portion that remains, because these are resonance lines, in absorption against the central white dwarf. Again, the advantage of Novi is they don't destroy the light source. So if we want to study the ejecta, we have the advantage that the white dwarf remains available as a background light source effectively forever or for as long as we can convince uh, telescope allocation committees to give us time, which is certainly not forever. Um, now, I wanted to show this also because the uh, behavior of different lines um, tells us something about things like the ionization structure. This, this is to just emphasize the point that I was making earlier. Okay, none of these um, are, the, well, I shouldn't say none of these are resonance lines. A few of them are, like that one. But um, these are the same nova at the same moment seen in different ions. This is why the older data, which concentrated on, say, H alpha as one line or helium-2 plus H alpha or something like that, was virtually useless. Each one of these is tracing a different density and temperature structure. Now, if we were dealing, say, with a planetary nebula or an H2 region, which many of you were familiar with, and it was in ionization equilibrium, this would be a very easy problem. We would simply use the individual ion to tell us what the, to, to constrain what the ionization field looked like. This isn't as simple. This is out of ionization balance because the recombination times for several of these species, especially for the helium-2, at the stage in which these spectra were taken, is starting to become comparable to the expansion time. Now, let me make something clear. When you have ballistic expansion, remember the expansion time is simply the elapsed time. Okay, so um, all we have to know is how long it's been since the beginning of the explosion, and we know exactly what the density is at every point in the ejecta. So we know which parts are still in photoionization equilibrium, which parts are still in collisional ionization equilibrium, and which parts are being uh, controlled only by the rate at which the, the electron density of the background is dropping. And so different lines here are giving us what look like different structures. This is just the chance ionization structure that we happen to get from each one of them. Um, this is another example that here, um, this is the comparison of the nitrogen two line and in this case, the here. So we have here, neutral oxygen, ionized, ionized nitrogen, nitrogen four, um, each one of these in now a single nova is tracing the everything from the neutral gas to uh, fairly highly ionized and fairly highly excited states. Okay. Um, Now, uh, just to show that we really can understand this rather simply, I'll show some examples in just a minute. But um, this is a, well, one of these is fictitious and one of them is real. Um, the profile here of the ox, this is the oxygen three line, is an ionized line, ground state transition, 
um, forbidden line, and this is a model of the ejecta, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. And as I warned you, this is, well, this is going to be broken up, but um, I also wanted to show here, again, the difference between different ions at the same stage. So this is the oxygen, this is oxygen three, so twice ionized oxygen, um, singly ionized oxygen, neutral oxygen. Um, at the same stage, so with different density sensitivities and different temperature sensitivities, okay? And these are the highest ionization species that one sees, indicating that, again, you have a very hot white dwarf which is illuminating the ejecta, calcium five, iron seven, oxygen five. Um, so we have five ionization stages and a very wide variety of density and temperature tracers that we can work with. Now, uh, if it puts it in perspective, this is what I'm talking about when mentioning the idea of a pseudo-photosphere. Um, it's probably something that's familiar to all of you. This is, I had to show one shot of Pisa. Um, okay, uh, somewhere in here we have the equivalent of a pseudo-photosphere. Look, if you want to make this a cosmological simulation, you can do this too. This is the same as the reionization stage of the universe, right? So here's the formation of the background radiation. This is where it starts turning marginally optically thin. Obviously, there's some structure here. I think that's a fiat. And otherwise, you can see that there's a structure here which was already present in the medium, except that it looks uniform here because it's completely optically thick. Okay, so does that make the point clear? Um, the reason I was emphasizing without talking about the structure of the ejecta, the spectra. Let me explain, there was actually a pedagogical reason. It wasn't simply a poorly constructed talk. Some of you are doing cosmological simulations and you've worried about things like the reionization of the universe. ANOVA is that in fast forward. That is, you have exactly the same problem, in fact, Ballistic trajectories are also called in the other end of the business a Hubble flow. And so what you have is a finite mass ejecta which are illuminated by a central object whose optical depth is, sorry, the surrounding medium of which has a time dependent optical depth which is falling as a power law in time. Consequently, there is a point where the ionization of that ejecta is complete and the recombination does not occur again. That's why I decided to emphasize that at the beginning because so many of you are familiar with that in the cosmological context. This is cosmology in about 500 or 1,000 solar radii, not 500 or 1,000 megaparsecs, okay? It's the same process doesn't matter that we're talking about the Iron Curtain, it's the same process. And in fact, one of the other things that I should add is that during the recombination event, we do not see dust formation, but we do see dust formation when the recombination wave has passed and we're beginning to see reionization of the ejecta. But this is effectively a nova envelope in its marginally optically thin stage. And consequently, you can also use this in your head uh, as a model for how a stellar wind behaves, okay? Um, now, the other thing which is really, I, th I think, quite remarkable about the, the, our, the recent results that we're getting 
is something that would not have been possible to emphasize something observational before the advent both of modern detectors and of very good high resolution spectrographs. Now you would think that if you're studying something, and I'm emphasizing this for those of you who do supernovae, you would think that if you've got a velocity of 10,000 kilometers per second, that a resolution of 100,000 is a complete waste of time because after all, everything just gets washed out, okay? That may be true in the initial stages where it's optically thick and you can't see into the layers. But as it becomes more optically thin, the higher the resolution, the more individual structure you're able to perceive. And one of the things that we've been trying to do, um, which is, I guess, new for this particular attempt, is use all of the information in the line profiles for the determination of plasma parameters um, without using photoionization assumptions. So this is an example of what you can do with the oxygen three lines. This is a logarithmic plot just to show that you start out in the earliest stages with extremely broad wings and then gradually that stuff has a decreasing emission measure. The, the emission measure is going like t to the minus three. So over fairly short periods of time, you lose the highest velocity material. And what you're left with is this relatively low velocity stuff. But by using very high resolution, you can treat, as I said, each point in the profile as a map to a point in the ejecta. And so we can determine the density as a function of position in the ejecta at least in two dimensions. That is, we know the positive and the negative velocity side of, of the flow. And what this translates to down here, this is an order of magnitude in the electron density, is the electron density as a function of velocity, which means the electron density is a function of position in the ejecta, with no assumptions about symmetry, okay? This requires resolutions of at least 30,000 to pull this one off. Um, we can then look at the evolution of the individual portions of the ejecta, which means we can look at what the abundances are in every point in the ejection, okay? So again, we can look at whether the ejecta are chemically, thermally, and dynamically homogeneous. Each point then can give us the electron density as a function of time. Um, the one here that you see plotted in the dotted line, so these are the individual measures of the electron density at different velocities. Um, this is for these peaks, and this is for the wings of the profile, so the region here and in the wings. And the peaks are uh, portions of slightly higher density. And what you're seeing here is not a fit. That's overlaying the model prediction. That is, if we have ballistic trajectories, what we would expect is this line, which is a t to the minus three. Okay, again, this is not a fit, it's just an overlay. Um, the fit, which is these denser portions, so the substructures, is giving a slightly different, slightly slower decrease in the electron densities. So again, this says that we have distinct structures whose recombination rate may be different than the diffuse rate. This is exactly the same sort of thing you have in cosmological simulations, where you have different densities 
in the expanding background and the recombinations are occurring at different rates. Okay? Now, um, one last thing. I'm, I have to show this because I think it's really pretty. Excuse me. Um, this is something that Although the, the plot may not show just how beautiful this is, this is something that was completely unexpected. Um, the very last spectrum we got of the last of these novae, Novus, uh, Novus and Taurus, which was very bright, and being very bright, of course, it occurred in the wrong hemisphere. Um, so we couldn't get lots and lots of observations on this thing. But we managed to convince ESO to give us some uh, Uvis time. And we also had HST. Um, this line, this, this bottom line here, is um, something that if any of you have ever looked at planetary nebulae or symbiotic stars, you would recognize immediately. Uh, this is the nitrogen four line. It's a doublet of, it's a fine structure line. And um, it's also an intercombination line. And the, ratio of these two lines, which are these two peaks, to these two lines, which are the 1483 and the 1486, this ratio gives you the density, completely independently of all of the other tracers, okay? Now, these lines are separated by only a few hundred kilometers per second, like 500 kilometers per second. And under normal conditions, as you see here for another nova, they're completely blended. Here, the individual substructures happen to be sufficiently distinct that we're able to see them, okay? So someday these are going to show up as knots when interferometry resolves this ejecta. At this point, this has not yet been done by interferometry. Okay? Um, now, the other thing that to emphasize is that novi um, are also sources of extremely high energy phenomena. That is, Probably, it's going to be a, a general statement, probably all classical novae are gamma ray sources, if they're close enough. Um, these happen to be four in the last four years, which are quite close. Um, leaving aside this one, which as I said is a freak, this is a symbiotic type. So this one represents not a test ban in space, but a nuclear test, uh, we'll say, on like the Kamchatka Peninsula. Um, that is, this is a ground burst. These are air bursts, okay? So um, specifically, V959 Mon, which was the one that started all of this, was um, the actually discovered in gamma rays before it was seen in the optical uh, because of, of solar obscuration. But in addition to uh, V339 Dell, there are now two others. This is from a paper we did a, a couple of years ago now. Um, but the gamma ray emission peaks within the first 10 or 15 days. Okay, this has nothing to do with nuclear decay, which is one of the reasons why people started observing novae in gamma rays at the beginning, because one of the predictions of the TNR is that among other species that should be out of equilibrium and mixed into the ejecta, you should have, for example, sodium-22. And so you should be able to see the decay lines from that, and also from lithium and beryllium. The thing that's important here is these are not nuclear lines and these are in the MeV range. In fact, the emission extends up to about 100 MeV and it's confined to the first couple of weeks, which is exactly when the ejector is still optically thick. Okay? Now, 
why I'm jumping up and down about this is the easiest way to get gammas is to accelerate protons. And we know you can accelerate protons really easily if you have internal shocks. If you've got multiple ejections in a very short time, the sort of thing that gives rise to a ballistically expanding ejecta, not like a supernova, you're going to have some material which is ejected faster than others. You're going to have individual regions, filaments that are colliding with each other. And the result is you'll see this mess when the stuff turns optically thin, those individual filaments I was showing you. And at the same time, in the optically thick stage, when the ejecta turn optically thin at gamma ray energies. So when the Thomson cross-section and the Klein-Nashina cross-section drop, sorry, optical depths, drop sufficiently that the gammas can appear, that is precisely within the first couple of weeks, after which you simply won't see the gammas anymore. The densities have dropped. You'll see evidence for the shocks from high from hard x-rays, but you won't see anything this energetic. Yes? It's almost, okay, I'll be very biased in this. I, I think this is a, this is um, a hadronic process. Um, that you're, that this is mostly from the protons, but obviously electrons are going to be accelerated and there's evidence in the later stages when the radio turns optically thin that there's a synchrotron component. Yeah, well, the, the, the difference is here we have um, background densities that are about, um, oh, at least 10 orders of magnitude larger than a molecular cloud. So um, the, the protons have very, very small mean free paths. I mean, we can easily, we can easily explain this by just pion production. Okay, and then you simply ask at what point would that become optically thin? So the acceleration could be occurring continually, um, but the main loss mechanism is if it's pions going to then turn optically thin for the first time at like five days. Okay, now from that, if it's pions, okay, if it's the protons that are being accelerated, you can make a guess as to what the ejective mass are. Typically, 10 to the minus five to 10 to the minus four solar masses. If you ask, what do you get from all of this other analysis I've been showing you of how much mass is in the ejecta, how much mass is in these individual substructures? The answer is 10 to the minus five to 10 to the minus four solar masses. In other words, there's a consistency here. There's nothing special which means we might be able to use this to understand the acceleration process. Okay? bright enough to be able to say a lot about that. We don't really know the spectra very well. We know where the cutoff is. Um, we also know that there is one difference, namely this source, which is the one that looks more like a supernova than these in the sense that here the acceleration was occurring at a shock which was moving into a background. In the others, it's internal. So there, that's the difference. Um, otherwise, there's no reason to think in this one that it's anything but the protons. Okay, that answer it? Um, now, 
Um, I, I have a nasty, uh, this, this, there's no reason to, to darken the room. I have a nasty habit of, like, of enjoying photographing while I'm driving. Um, it's a way of feeling Italian. And um, this, whoop, sorry. Um, so, um, this is just something to give you as a picture to think about, that's a Nova ejection. Okay, so when I'm talking about these substructures, you, you've seen them lots of times. Um, in exactly the, the same way, these are simply hot and glowing. Okay, um, it's a single point explosion, it expands as a, a linear velocity law, and uh, you can really model this rather effectively, um, and to show you that, yes, <laughs> Novi really look like that, uh, this is an HST image in 03 of Nova Dell 1967 that was taken about uh, 15 years ago. Um, the central white dwarf is under the saturated part, and these are the individual knots. Now, um, to explain then what you're actually seeing as a structure, um, this is what produces that. That is, here we have two different ionization regions. Um, this is a simple biconical ejection event. Each one of these can be treated as an individual knot, and the, uh, the, the spectrum that's formed by this um, Well, the spectrum that's formed by it also allows you to predict these ring structures. Okay, the top is two observations taken two years apart of the NOVA that I had shown you a while back, uh, NOVA Cygni 1992. Okay, these are taken in um, 03. Uh, they were taken with HST. Okay, the bottom are the, obs are the models that give you the line profiles. They were not modeled to produce the shell structures. Okay? Um, so that's the advertising. Um, this is just to show you what I'm talking about. The left, you've seen enough of the line profiles now from the other parts of the talk, okay? The left, is a model line profile. The right is the structure that gives you that line profile. It's a Monte Carlo simulation, so um, in the simplest possible circumstance, straight recombination, optically thin. You don't need any radiative transfer to do this. All you need is to impose the maximum velocity and the mass of the ejecta. Everything else is determined, okay? That's the predicted line profile for that structure, okay? So far? I'm sorry? Um, you're sitting on it. Okay, it is, <laughs> this is oriented for you. Okay, now, so it's the same, it's the same class of, of model as that. Um, this is a uh, barely published result that just um, appeared from HST. Again, that's the model that predicts the spectrum, the right are the HST images. For Nova, uh, this is uh, Nova Dell uh, 19, uh, 2013, okay? So this is the O3, these are the, the okay? These are the, re, these are optically thin transitions. That was predicted two years earlier based entirely on the line profiles. Again, you are on the earth. 
Okay, so this is properly oriented. Now, the last thing I wanted to show, because I think I've probably more than overstayed my welcome here. Okay, I want to show something which is, um, I think, the future. I've been talking about the results that we've gotten over the last few years. Um, this is a comparison between two resonance lines coming from this, roughly this, uh, uh, they're isoelectronic. So these are tracing the same gas. Um, this is Nova Centaurus. This is the last spectrum we got about a year ago from HST, which is, I will add, probably the last such spectrum you, you will ever see, um, given the lifetime of the satellite and the fact that you need the ultraviolet to do this. The blue is carbon and the white is nitrogen, okay? Now, these are both ground state transitions. You see that they're tracing the same dynamical structure. And because they're in absorption, those of us who can't do large-scale radiative transfer on supercomputers can do something really simple-minded in our heads. That is, this is straight column density. So as a function of velocity, what we're getting here is a map of the absorption column density. And we can then use the individual ratios to tell us what the N to C ratio is in each portion of the ejecta at that velocity. Okay? I'm, I'm so enthusiastic about this because we've never had anything like this before. And someday we'll even be able to do this in planetary nebulae and H2 regions with high enough sensitivity. So this is a test. Now, this is the part that is why I didn't show you lots of pretty simulations of the nucleosynthesis. The nitrogen to carbon ratio that we derive here has, is out of the range that we can get from any current nucleosynthetic calculation. We're getting an N to C ratio that's 200 times the solar value. No nucleosynthesis at this point can produce a ratio that's greater than about 10 times the solar value. Clearly, there's some very deep mixing going on here. The nuclear calculations, no matter how sophisticated our hydrodynamics have been, and like some of you, we've also done three-dimensional hydro modeling. Uh, at this point, we have a constraint that's saying that not only aren't our models producing the right numbers, but, and now I'm going to emphasize this, these, although they don't look it, these have the same abundances. So these individual structures are individual and yet chemically homogeneous. Okay? We have structure imposed on the ejecta, which is organized on scales of 10% or so. This is not a propagating shock, again, this is a single ejection event. All of this is the result of these individual structures like the fireworks colliding with each other. And yet, something has sufficiently mixed this before the explosion that when these structures leave the white dwarf, they've already been thoroughly mixed. Now, the future here, so I can leave you with something <laughs> as a homework problem for the next decade. Um, theoretically, one of the things we must understand is what the accretion process is like in these systems. Okay, we know that they're accreting from disks. That's almost irrelevant. But when we're starting the explosion calculation in this TNR, we know damn well that this isn't simply stuff that was quietly placed gently on an otherwise isolated white dwarf. This stuff was mixed. As I said, it's a garbage dump. And when you're throwing the refuse onto the white dwarf, you're not doing it at zero velocity. 
It's going to deeply mix. There's going to be a velocity gradient across this region. We haven't a clue right now what that looks like. So those of you who are interested in doing things like merger, take a look at something as simple as ANOVA. Um, in the explosion dynamics, there's something, again, that must be missing because these are coherent, organized structures, and yet when we do the calculation of the 3D, we find that we get something approaching a Kolmogorov spectrum. So the material, at least at some level, has become almost homogeneously turbulent. In the absence of rotation, is this a signal that the rotation is actually somehow ordering the medium? And the last point I want to make is something that's a major MHD problem. Um, I emphasize the observations. Now let me do something on theory. If you ask what's going to happen in the TNR, you have deep convection on a white dwarf in an environment where the temperature is reaching of the order um, 100, 100 megakelvin, okay? The turnover time for a typical uh, structure, typical convective structure, is of the order of a couple of hundred seconds. This is an ideal environment for a fast dynamo. So is what we're seeing in Novi, for example, these structures, in part the result of a fast dynamo, fast reconnection, the formation of flux ropes, and consequently that that is what's responsible for the acceleration process? I don't know yet but that's something we're beginning to work on now. So the emphasis here on the, the various phenomenological aspects is just to fill you in on why the theoretical models now must go to a new level, okay? We understand Novi. They are simple ejection events. Now come the real questions. They're not spherical. They're highly structured. They're chemically homogeneous in spite of there being large-scale coherent structures. There are clearly acceleration events going on within the structure as it's expanding, and yet those are very confined and also confined in time. Okay, I haven't even mentioned the little problem. Where the hell do these things come from? You know, why are there novi? Why do we have systems that have periods of 90 minutes and are accreting? How long does it take after the event for the accretion disk to reform? Why is it, and I'll leave with this one, why is it that within the last four years, one particular system in M31, of all places, has repeated as a classical nova, almost like clockwork, once a year. That is, something has produced a thermonuclear explosion on a time scale that is almost an order of magnitude. No, in fact, it is an order of magnitude faster than anything we thought possible. Because previously we thought that the time scale for recurrence was of order 10 years, as I said, you know, tenure time. Um, this one can actually be within, say, uh, a diploma thesis. Okay? Um, the other thing before I, I, I just finish, because he's going to throw me out here is um, just to emphasize that what sometimes seems to be a very simple, old, uninteresting pro problem, when you start looking at it and you see the ramifications of what you're doing, can turn not only beautiful, but vast. This is a simple problem. Thank you. Thanks for this 
very extended overview and the many spectra you've shown us and explained how to interpret them. We already had two questions. There must be more. Uh, you, you will be <laughs> really very kind. Yes, so Richard. Yeah, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you mentioned dust formation. I think you said that this happened when it became the envelope became optically thin. Is uh, that just a coincidence, or do you need a sort of photo uh, processing in order to fo uh, form the grains? Could you answer that? Do you understand my question? Okay. Um, yeah. And here, let's see if. I can only hope this, this will help uh, contextualize my answer. Okay, uh, this is the dust formation event in, in ANOVA, okay? Um, that is, at about uh, 60 or 80 days or 100 days, you suddenly get a very rapid drop in the optical flux. Um, so, and you get a, a concomitant increase in, in the infrared. So we know that dust is forming at that event. It, it wasn't present before. Right. Okay? Now, that's the model. Um, if it helps. Okay, but what goes into the model? I mean, yeah, do, do, you, do you need? It's, this is um, ion, ion driven kinetic aggregation. That is, you start out with a higher than normal abundance of carbon, you form initial nuclei. That is, you have the formation of, say, CN, where N would be something like five or six. So small cluster. Yeah, you need to go a certain NT regime in order to achieve this in situ in yes. the gas. Yes. Um, my question is, is that just is that just coincidental that that coincides with the large scale uh, optical depth? evolution, or is it just microscopically important for the formation? Or, or do you actually need these photons, which now get through, in order to help this well, chemical process? The photons. Okay, that's my answer. Yeah. Okay. That is, until the ionization, you cannot get the kinetic instability. Once it ionizes, and you have soft photons, so 4 to 5 eV, yeah. At that point, the clusters remain and additionally ionize. Very okay. Then the thing that stops the event, so this, this is not put in by hand. Okay, this is put in assuming ballistic expansion with the central source always on. This is simply when the uh, nucleation rate from this, ion, this ionization effect drops effectively to zero. And after that, the dust remains, and it just turns optically thin. Yeah, okay. If that makes any sense. It's interesting. It's not, a, it's not homogeneous nucleation. Um, I don't know, I, I, this, this is a fairly old result. Um, if I can get you interested in working on this, that would be even more interesting because this has um, the, the analogy that this was based on is thermonuclear tests. So my proposal would be you come to the dinner and, and then, then you can discuss the project and what your work here would be. Okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Is uh, one last quick question. Anna? No, 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 wait, wait. How far can the ejection material spread? So can metals from the snowway pollute surrounding gas? Uh, like the solar system? We, we, no, we, we have, if you want, spread. Um, the, these, are, these are equal opportunity polluters. Um, no pre-solar nova grains have been detected in meteoritic samples. So, um, 
at the, to, to ask, well, there, there are two different questions, so let me answer very quickly. Um, one is not the dynamical effect, but say the radiative effect. If you have one nova, roughly per cubic kiloparsec, happening at the recurrence rate that we know novae happen, so roughly one in like 10 to the four years. Um, you can maintain very easily the complete ionization of the halo of the galaxy to something like iron, uh, sorry, oxygen four or oxygen five. Okay, so these, are these could be a major ionization source because they're spread over very large regions. They have luminosities of up to 10 to the five solar luminosities. Now, for the dynamics, that's a really good question because these have fairly low filling factors. So you could have pieces of these things expanding to, to fairly large distances. Ex um, if resolved nova ejecta can easily be half a parsec in size. Um, the sorts of structures that you were seeing there are early structures, but um, old nova shells can last for centuries. I mean, you'll see them for an extremely long time because they're only, the only thing that's uh, decreasing their emissivity is the rate at which the individual knots are expanding. They're not photoionization anymore. They're just very slow recombiners. So eventually they just disappear, but you know, like clear air turbulence, as far as the galaxy is concerned, these things are going to be speed bumps in the gas. Um, they also happen, this would be an interesting thing to study, uh, they, they happen about every 10 to the four years. I mean, novae, even the so-called classical novae, that are not the fast repeaters, so the ones from intermediate mass white dwarfs, are gonna repeat on time scales of 1,000 or 10,000 years. Um, so you're, you're constantly agitating the medium. But the, the masses and the, and the impulses, or the, the momentum input from these things are, are so small that dynamically they're not going to have much of an effect except local. They might be important, for example, in, in globular clusters or in those or in cluster environments. Uh, but no, otherwise, on, on the largest scale, no. But they do allow us to study the same phenomena which supernovae would later show. <laughs> so with that, let's thank uh, Steve again for this very nice talk.